Okay, Philemon for uh, beginners. The title of this class, uh, Slavery and the Early Church. Uh, only one lesson. Uh, Philemon is a one uh, chapter book. Uh, I believe we can get through that uh, using up the time that we have. Let's talk about slavery uh, in the first century. To begin with, that's the context of this book. Slavery in the first century was uh, quite different than the slavery, for example, in early American history. Uh, in the first century, slavery was not based on culture, as it was here. Um, Africans uh, who were seized and sold into slavery by uh, both uh, African and uh, European traders at the time. This was not the nature of the slavery that existed in Roman times, first century times. In the first century uh, Roman Empire, slaves were the spoils of war. And all kinds of people, you know, all nationalities, black, white, Asian, you know, all kinds of cultural uh, individuals of different cultures is what I'm saying, uh, were conquered by the Roman military and thus became slaves. Some were rich, some were poor, you know, some had different cultures, different educations. The thing they had in common is that they were conquered by the Romans and put into slavery. In many cases, uh, people sold themselves into slavery because of debt. And these type of slaves were called bond servants. You see that term many times in the New Testament, bond servants. Uh, Roman masters usually treated their slaves with a measure of respect, and these had uh, responsible positions in the household in many cases. Slaves could marry, they could accumulate wealth, uh, and purchase their own freedom, as was the case with many. Uh, under Roman law, slaves were set free at the age of 30. Many of them were born into slavery. As many as uh, two-thirds of the empire at that time were slaves, but this number decreased rapidly in the first century and continued falling as Christian ideas began to take hold in that pagan society. Of course, this brings us to consider the ownership of slaves by Christians in the first century. We know this is the case because Paul provides instructions for both slaves and masters in his letter. So obviously there were you know, slaves who were Christians and there were masters who were Christians and you know, uh, Christian individuals owned slaves at that time. Uh, for example, we read in Ephesians uh, chapter six, Paul writes, slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good things each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So note the instructions that he gives to masters and slaves. Sincere obedience, serve unto the Lord. In other words, serving your master as if you were serving the Lord. Serve with the hope of a blessing. And then of course the masters to treat their slaves with sincerity and a reminder that God will judge both slaves and masters. Uh, another place where we have instruction uh, for slaves, uh, Colossians chapter three, verse 22, Paul writes again, slaves and all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So we notice here a, 
a certain consistency um, as far as the instructions are concerned. Let's look at the list that we get from Colossians. Again, sincere obedience, serving the Lord. In other words, you're serving your master as if you're serving the Lord in that spirit. Serve with the hope of a blessing. Uh, the other idea injected into Colossians is the Lord serves with you. The idea that the Lord will help you, the slave, do a good job, strengthen you in that role that you have. Uh, that God will punish evil slaves. And then of course that masters judge fairly and that masters also have a master uh, in heaven. Again, pretty consistent teaching as far as uh, master-slave relationship. What you don't see here is what? Well, what you don't see is, let's rise up, let's start a revolution, let's, there's no, not even a hint of that in this. Now in other passages, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 to 24, Paul urges slaves to accept their present situation, but if the opportunity to gain their freedom comes up, he says they should take their freedom. So he wasn't promoting slavery as a, you know, an end result. He was commenting on what existed in society. Paul's approach to this social evil was not to start a movement or to use violence to attack the established order of things. He worked through the church in providing God's word and will on this issue. Now the early church, what's interesting is the early church recognized no status difference between slave and master. Everyone sat together in the assembly. So that was one way that the church, the early church, gave the signal, not let's start a revolution, let's start a war, but gave the signal of how does God see you? And so when the master and the slave came into the assembly, there wasn't like a back row or a side row or on the floor where the slaves sat and up front or, or in the back, let's put it that way, where the masters would sit. Everyone sat together. Uh, slaves in the early church were allowed to serve as elders and unlike pagan gravestones that noted if the deceased was a slave, Christian graves did not mark if one had been a slave or not. It wasn't an issue. And of course it wasn't an issue, why? Because Christians are citizens of the heavenly kingdom. They're only passing through. According to Ignatius, second century bishop, church funds were often used to buy the freedom of slaves or for slaves. Uh, some Christians even surrendered their own freedom in order to ransom and free others. Clement, uh, again, another early church father speaks of this. Uh, marriage among slaves was protected. And early Christians urged non-Christians to free their slaves or allow them to purchase their freedom. And so beginning with Paul and other apostles and teachers, a campaign of teaching, exhortation, examples of individuals setting their slave free, and the equal status given them in the church, slavery eventually died out in the Roman Empire. And so in this historical and social context that Paul, uh, it's in this historical and social context that Paul writes the brief epistle to Philemon, urging him to free a runaway slave, okay? So let's take a little look at the, the letter itself. The letter was written by Paul while he was in a Roman prison, awaiting his trial before Caesar sometime between 61 and 63 AD. While in prison, Paul was allowed to receive visitors and send and receive correspondence. If you remember our, our study of the book of Acts, he wasn't like in a dungeon, you know, uh, shackled to a, to, a, to a post or a pillar, he was allowed his own private quarters. He was allowed to receive people and teach and so on and so forth. Some historians think that as his trial drew closer, he was taken out of that particular uh, you know, setting and put in a regular uh, prison. But either way, he had a certain amount of liberty to receive uh, visitors and also to send and receive uh, correspondence. 
So the two main individuals mentioned in this letter are first of all Philemon. He was a man of wealth and importance who was converted by Paul, we'll read about that in verse 19, and probably came into contact with the apostle while he was in Ephesus, while Paul was there and while Philemon was there. Later on Philemon moved to, or he returned to Colossae and was a member of the church there. You know, the letter to the Colossians, well that, that, that town, that city, that church, Philemon was a member of that church. And then Onesimus, was a slave belonging to Philemon who had run away and made his way to Rome. And while there he came into contact with Paul and was converted. And he remained with Paul and ministered to Paul's needs. So during this period Epaphroditus, one of Paul's co-workers who had planted the church at Colossae, there's the connection, all right. Epaphroditus arrives in Rome with a gift for Paul from the Philippian church. While there, while he was there, and here are some of the cities, right? You give you a fix there. There's Ephesus right there and Philippi. There's Paul in Rome, okay? And see the church at Colossae, Asia Minor there. So while there, Epaphroditus tells Paul of some trouble in the form of false teaching that is brewing in the church at Colossae. And so in Philemon, verse 23, we learn that Epaphroditus is detained for a while with Paul, but later he's released and he's given a letter to take back to the Philippians, thanking them for their gifts. So Epaphroditus arrives in Rome, has a gift for Paul from the Philippians. While he's there, he tells Paul, aside from the Philippians who are doing pretty good, the church at Colossae is having problems, okay? So after Epaphroditus' departure, Paul writes several other letters, okay? One of these letters is for the Colossian church regarding the false teachers and the heresy that, they are, uh, that they're dealing with. A second letter is a personal letter to Philemon who was a member of that Colossian church regarding his runaway slave Onesimus. And then thirdly, he writes another letter to Ephesus that was experiencing problems of unity and fellowship. So these three letters were delivered by Tychicus, one of Paul's co-workers. Onesimus, one of Paul, excuse me, Onesimus was placed in the care of Tychicus in order to protect him against uh, arrest by slave catchers, bounty hunters that were roaming around looking for slaves. So if he's in the protective custody of Tychicus, he is safe from these individuals. And Tychicus would return him to Philemon along with Paul's letter. Okay? So we got all the characters straight and the letters straight. So let's take a look at an outline here of, of this uh, brief epistle. Paul's greeting to Philemon, verses one to three. Paul's prayer concerning Philemon, verses four to seven. Paul's appeal to Philemon, verses eight to 20. And Paul's request and blessing on Philemon, verses 21 to 25. So there's a, a brief outline, a little sketch of what's going on, who did what, who's writing to whom and why. Let's take a look at the text, begin with that greeting, shall we? Verse one to three, Paul says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul summarizes his personal situation by referring to himself as a prisoner of Christ, meaning his imprisonment is in the cause of Christ, and Timothy is with him, caring for his needs. Philemon is the recipient of the letter, Athia, his wife, Archippus, probably their son. The church met in their home, which was located in the city of Colossae. Paul not only offers a, a precious blessing, you know, grace and peace on Philemon and his family, 
but also comments on his value in Christ as a beloved brother and co-worker with Paul. Wouldn't that be wonderful if, some, if Paul wrote you and said that about you? I mean, that would be marvelous, wouldn't it? So this would be high praise for any Christian by an inspired apostle. Because it's not obviously not false flattery, you know? he's not flattering him like empty flattery, he's an inspired apostle. He speaks the truth, he speaks from God. And so Philemon's the real deal. He is who Paul says he is, very loving man, good co-worker. Paul continues with his prayer, verses four to uh, seven. He says, I thank God always making mention of you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. So Paul's prayer of thanksgiving is motivated by what he knows about Philemon. That's what's moving him to pray. His love of God and those who belong to God, meaning Philemon's love of God and those who belong to God. That thing about Philemon is what motivates Paul to pray. His faithfulness to God and the saints, both slave and free. And Philemon's love and faith have been a blessing to everyone. Now what is not said yet is that he will base his request on the knowledge of these qualities. In other words, I, I am motivated to pray because of your faithfulness and your love for both, you know, for everyone and you know, you're, you're a good worker. You know, and because you're like this, he doesn't say it yet, but because you're like this, I'm going to ask you something very special. That this is just the, the basis, okay? He makes the appeal in verses eight to 21. Verse eight and nine, we'll just read that for the moment. He says, therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So at first glance, it would seem that Paul is pulling rank. Certainly that's the way I saw it when I first read this. You know, uh, as an apostle, I could order you to do as I command, because I'm an apostle and you're not an apostle, so I can tell you what to do. Now when he says the confidence in Christ, what he speaks of when he says this confidence of Christ is not, I'm sure Jesus will back me up in this. That's not what he's saying. He's telling Philemon that in the situation that he will be talking about, which will be the return of Onesimus, he is so confident in the will of Christ and Philemon's Christian maturity, which he's already talked about, his faith and love, that he could simply tell him what to do. In other words, not order, you know, if I just explain to you what the, what the right thing is to do, I'm confident that you will do it. That's how sure I am of you. So Paul's sure of one thing, he's sure of what Christ would do in this situation. I have confidence in that. And he's also sure in, uh, of Philemon's faith and love and that Philemon wants to do what Christ wants him to do. He's so sure of that, that you know, he could just kind of just, just tell him, hey, this is what I want you to do, period. And he would do it. However, because of Paul's love and his knowledge of Philemon's love, he will not frame his request in this way but put the entire matter on a higher plane. Not simply doing the right thing, but doing the loving thing. You know, you ask somebody for a favor, you kind of know for sure, you know, that they're going to do it for you. You, know, so you ask your mom, okay, mom. Mom never refuses, right, to do a favor. 
you could just say, hey, this is what I need, and you know, could you be here at two o'clock? You, know, you could do it that way. Or you could frame the request in such a way that mom can offer it to you. So she gets the pleasure of offering you something. This is what's going on here. He knows that Philemon would do the right thing. He wants to frame it in such a way to give Philemon the opportunity you know, to do the loving thing, to participate in the thing. So his reference to age, you know, he talks about he, he's an old apostle. You know, uh, Paul is about 60 years old, approximately, when he writes this. Um, an old 60 years old. If you've, been, if you've had like the lash three or four times in your life and you've been, <laughs> you've been shipwrecked and you've been beaten to death and you've starved and been cold and spent years in jails and this and that, your 60 years is a, you know, a well-worn 60 years. So his reference to age and imprisonment is a reminder to Philemon of Paul's long service and suffering when considering what will be asked of him in the next passage. Let's face it, to lose the service and the financial value of a slave by granting him freedom without cost. Did we forget the money aspect here? In those days, the furthest I could get it was in 79 AD. 79 AD, a slave in the Roman Empire sold for 625 denarii, equivalent of $32,000. That's a lot of money, a lot of money. So it wasn't just about, oh, do me a small favor. You used to think Onesimus was a slave and now I just want you to think of him as a free person. Yeah, sure. There's money involved, cost involved. So in these verses, Paul makes a specific appeal. He kind of gets down to it. Verse 10, he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. So he names the runaway slave Onesimus. Uh, a little word play here. Onesimus, his name, the name Onesimus means useful. That's what his name means, useful. And Paul's connection to him, in other words, he converted him while in prison, gave birth to him, meaning he, he brought him to Christ. So it's interesting the play on words using Onesimus' name. He says he was useless to, you know, this useful one. He was useless to you, Philemon, both spiritually, because he was a pagan, and financially, he had run away. So this slave named Useful was useless to you. Now he says he is useful to you spiritually because now he is a believer and shares your faith. And he's now useful to you physically because he was returning Philemon to Philemon's household. Many times in those days, freed slaves often worked for their former masters, earning a salary, almost like a promotion. So that, you know, if they were married and they had their quarters and they had their jobs and so on and so forth and they saved their money and they bought their freedom, you know, why would they throw away the job that they had and the money that they were earning? Now they, they were serving at a different status. Verse 12 and 13 says, I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wished to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment uh, for the gospel. Again, very interesting interplay of ideas here. Paul offers Philemon a spiritual way of seeing things through the eyes of faith, where events and people act according to God's will and providence. So he's saying, this is not just a runaway slave found by me. Onesimus, a slave sent by Philemon to care for Paul in prison and finding salvation there. So through the eyes of faith, can you not see that God has used his runaway status and the fact that he found me and I brought him uh, to salvation and now he's serving me. He's saying, to Onis, uh, he's saying to Philemon, look at this through the eyes of faith. See this as 
you have sent Onesimus to me to serve me and help me during my time in prison. See the situation in this way, through the eyes of faith. Verses 14 to 16, he says, but without your consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. There's the idea of framing it in such a way that Philemon has a say in it. Philemon has at least the opportunity to offer generosity. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but now how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Of course, doing the right thing required something of Paul as well as Philemon. Paul had to give up something too. Onesimus was taking care of him while he was in prison. So according to the law, Onesimus belonged to Philemon and only he could legally free him. So Paul wants Philemon to do this freely and not have it imposed on him by Paul's status as an apostle or a favor because of his age or his suffering in prison. Again, how gentle, how meek Paul is in dealing with Philemon. Again, Paul asks Philemon to view this situation through the eyes of faith. Not simply a runaway slave returned to his owner, but God working to convert a pagan slave into a believing servant ministering to Paul in prison and a brother in Christ to his former master. Something that would be a spiritually maturing challenge, not for Onesimus, for Philemon. It's not just the money. It's not just the money. It's the social status that changes. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Verses 17, he says, if then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So Paul addresses the cost of what he is asking Philemon. You know, sometimes somebody asks you to do something, I don't know, a favor, okay? They, they ask you to, could you come and help me mow my lawn? All right, whatever, my, my, my equipment's broken. Could you, you know, so it'll take a couple hours Saturday morning. And you say, sure, I'll come do that. So you go and you help the person mow their lawn, you know, a couple hours and that's it. And they say, well, thank you. you know. And in their mind, well, you, know, you had nothing to do. You came over, you mowed and, you, you know, and your buddies and that's good. What they don't know is that you had other plans for Saturday morning. And you had things set up for Saturday morning. And your back was aching Saturday morning. In other words, the person who asked you the favor did not know how much granting that favor was going to cost you. So Paul wants to make sure that Philemon knows, that Paul knows how much this is going to cost Philemon. So that his gift, so that his affirmation will receive full value in Paul's eyes, okay? So Paul addresses the cost of what he is asking Philemon. First of all, the actual value of Onesimus as a slave, you know, the 30 plus thousand dollars, you know, poof, that's gone. Paul says, you know, put it to my account. Did you think Paul had 625 denarii in his purse after having spent the better part of four years in jail? And then, of course, the cost of replacing him and his service. Now he has to pay somebody else to do what Onesimus may have been doing. And then there may have been other damages or lost items connected to his running away. 
And then of course, as I mentioned before, there was the social challenge of accepting back a former slave as an equal brother in Christ. It's like the CEO, I'm, I'm making this example, but the CEO of uh, General Motors, uh, his daughter marries the guy who just started working in the house cleaning department of General Motors in one of the plants in some faraway place. You know, a big difference in social levels here. Then all of a sudden, whoops, these things are made even. Not only that, Onesimus was a runaway slave. It's different if you're having the slave and the slave buys his freedom and, and so on. No, 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 this was a runaway slave. Who knew what people were saying about Onesimus when he took off? Who knew what would have happened to him if the slave uh, catchers, you know, the bounty hunters, would have caught him? So Paul is asking uh, Philemon, you know, let, let's just wipe the slate clean. You just take him back as an equal brother, family. So whatever Onesimus owes, Paul says, transfer that debt to me in the same way that we transfer our debt for sin to Jesus on the cross. See the parallel there? So what is unsaid here is, if Paul owed Philemon this debt, would Philemon press to collect it? Remember what I said at the beginning? Paul says, the reason, one of the reasons I pray is because I know how faithful you are. I know how loving you are. <laughs> so his, his request is based on his knowledge of Philemon as a man. Paul also reminds Philemon of his own personal debt for the salvation of his soul since Paul converted him. Both he and Onesimus owe Paul a greater debt than Onesimus owes to Philemon. That's the point he's making. You two may owe each other some indebtedness, but both of you owe me, Paul, he says, a bigger debt than you owe each other. So Onesimus was useful in Christian service by ministering to Paul in prison. Now Philemon can be useful to Paul by receiving back Onesimus as a free and equal brother in Christ. This, he says, will refresh and encourage Paul as he suffers for the gospel in prison. The same gospel that saved the souls of both Philemon and Onesimus and put each of these men into Paul's debt. All right, so he moves on. Last verse, Paul's request and blessing. He says, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. So Paul summarizes not the appeal or the details of the letter, but his feelings and attitude concerning Philemon. He is confident that knowing Philemon to be a man of faith and genuine love, his response will not be anger or offense, resentful obedience, or some form of passive aggressive hypocrisy. He knows that Philemon will go the second mile in his response to Paul's appeal. He is a man of faith and love and he will respond in this way. You know, we get a hint of his positive response to this when reading Paul's letter to the Colossians, where Paul refers to Onesimus and calls him a faithful, beloved brother, Colossians 4, verse 9. Also interesting historically, uh, Ignatius, uh, who a church father, writer, uh, lived 35 AD to 108 AD in an early um, uh, writing. Um, um, he was based in Antioch, this uh, Ignatius, he mentions that Onesimus eventually served as an elder in the church at, uh, at Ephesus. And so the writings of the early fathers are not inspired, but they help us understand the history of the church at that time. Uh, verse 22 to 25, he says, at the same time also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow, Epaphras, Epaphroditus, you know, they use both names, this is the same person. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark 
Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your, uh, with your spirit. So we know that Paul won his freedom from Roman prison and spent the next two years revisiting various congregations he had established on his previous missionary journeys. He had originally wanted to go to Spain, right? He wanted to go to Spain to preach the gospel there, but once he was, in, once he was released from prison, he changed his mind and decided to go back and visit the churches that he had, uh, he had established. So this request for lodging suggests that he was confident in his eventual release. Uh, release. Not all who are mentioned are in prison with him here, but uh, they were individuals who visited and worked with Paul. However, they were known by Philemon and this is why they're mentioned. Paul closes with another blessing similar to the one in the opening verse, but this time offered to uh, only Philemon himself. We know in 66 AD, Paul again was arrested, he was in prison for a second time during the persecution of Christians under Nero. Paul wrote his final epistle, which is uh, Second uh, Timothy, and uh, from prison at that time, and he was executed by beheading the following year in the year 67 AD. So through God's providence, a runaway slave is converted by an apostle in a Roman jail who not only knows the slave's owner, but has also been responsible for his conversion as well. Today we would say it was a God thing. It was a God thing. I mean, in, in the city of Rome, how did one slave eventually hook up, bump into Paul in jail? How, how did that happen? And how is it that Paul happens to know that one slave's master? And not only that, he converted that slave's master. I mean, you know, it's a God thing, right? This slave is then returned with a letter asking the slave owner to receive back his slave as a free and equal brother in Christ. As far as we know, Onesimus was freed, accepted as a brother in the Lord, and served as a leader in the church at Ephesus, the same congregation where the apostle John served. So here's the one lesson I'd like to draw here, or highlight. Christians see life through the eyes of faith. You know, Paul presented Onesimus' story and Philemon's response through the eyes of faith in order to make sense of it. It was God's providence that sent Onesimus to him in prison and then back to Philemon for restoration as a free and equal brother in Christ. This wasn't about the cost of a runaway slave. It was a seed planted by God in the early church surrounded by, pagan, by a pagan empire where slavery was common. It was a teachable moment recorded in a personal letter to one man, and this letter has been read throughout history by millions of people. In the letter, it encapsulated the spirit and wisdom of God about this evil slavery which was eventually discontinued and condemned as Christianity spread throughout the empire and the world. God continues to work in this way to this day, in big ways on the world stage, as well as intimate ways in our lives. Never underestimate you know, the God thing, never underestimate that. Never think that God doesn't continue to work in fabulous ways uh, today. So these things are not hidden, but can only be seen with the eyes of faith. That's the point I'm making. Try to see things in your own life through the eyes of, of faith. Our task is to ask God to open our own eyes of faith so that we can see clearly what He is doing in our own lives. And believe me, He is doing something as well as what He is doing on the world stage around us. Try to keep this vision of faith, you know, your eyes open as eyes of faith, and it will help you, it'll help all of us make sense of what God is doing, even if it doesn't make sense to people in the world. Okay, so one, one man's take on the book of Philemon, a little bit of information about the history of slavery in the first century church. That's it, we're done. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>